Can I tell you something about our first speaker as I introduce him? There are some people that you've listened to in your life where you could go back and you could point out places in the road where you were listening to something specific that was said, something you heard, something that was altering to your way of thinking. I could take you to a spot in Little Rock where I was listening to a cassette tape as I was driving back and forth on my daily commute one day. And on that cassette tape, I heard Dr. R.C. Sproul say that the problem in our church today is that most people do not believe that God is as holy as he is and that most of us do not believe that we are as sinful as we are. And I remember being pricked and provoked by that statement recognizing my own tendency to think too highly of myself and conversely my own tendency to minimize the holiness of God. That theme, the holiness of God, is a theme that has marked Dr. Sproul's ministry over the now more than 50 years that he has been ministering. But beyond that theme, the larger theme of the Reformation truths that we have been celebrating here at NRB this week have been a part of what Dr. Sproul has almost single-handedly reintroduced to the church in our generation. And it's a real privilege for us to have here on the closing night of this event, our first speaker tonight, the founder and president of Ligonier Ministries. Would you give a warm NRB welcome to Dr. R.C. Sproul? It's a delight for me to be here, a singular honor and privilege for this annual event. It's a special time for me, for my family, and for all of us on the staff at Ligonier. And I'd like to begin by opening a prayer, shall we? Our Father and our God, as we think tonight of those central truths that were so vital to the history of your church, that we remember in these days, we ask that the Holy Spirit would be present in power as we contemplate these truths, particularly the central importance of Your Word, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. As you've been hearing throughout the week that this is 2017 and we are keenly aware that this is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation that began in the month of October in the year 1517. Somebody said to me recently that the anniversary of the Reformation only comes every 500 years. <laughs> and so here we go again. Well, in any case, We've looked at the different solas that became key points of discussion during the 16th century Reformation, and it has been left to me to discuss briefly the affirmation of sola scriptura. And to introduce that concept, let me say to you that historians, as they think about the significance of the 1517 monumental change, cataclysmic change indeed in the history of the church, that they ask the simple question, what caused these things to come to pass? And there were multiple influences that were involved at that time, but again it's customary for historians to indicate two chief causes for the Protestant Reformation, and they distinguish them between what is called the material cause on the one hand and the formal cause on the other. And those of you who are students of philosophy understand that that language originated with Aristotle who uh, distinguished several different causes of motion or of change and included many more such subtle distinctions between the two material 
and formal causes. We know that the material cause of the Reformation, or the question of what was the matter at the time, focused on the issue of the gospel and the answer to the question, how are we as unjust people justified in the presence of a holy God? And so, the central material aspect was the debate over the issue of justification by faith alone. But throughout that discussion of the material principle of the Reformation, there was always just beneath the surface and quite frequently bubbled to the surface of the controversy the issue of the formal cause of the Reformation, and that issue was the question of authority. By what authority did Luther declare his doctrine of justification by faith alone? And we all know that there in, on 1517 on Al Hallows Eve, Luther posted his 95 theses on the church door, or the castle church door at Wittenberg. He was not involved in an act of vandalism. This was the standard place where notices were posted, and the theses were written in Latin, particularly because Luther meant the issues to be discussed simply among the <coughs> members of the faculty of the colleagues that he had there at Wittenberg. He certainly had no intention of raising these issues publicly, but some enterprising students took it upon themselves when they understood uh, the import of these theses that Luther wanted to discuss, translated them into the vernacular, translated them into German without Luther's knowledge and without his permission, and within two weeks, the 95 theses were in every village and hamlet throughout Germany, and all of a sudden, we had the uh, cataclysmic experience of the Protestant Reformation. Karl Barth once observed that Luther had no idea of what he was starting, and he was like a blind man climbing the tower in a church, and he lost his grip and began to fall from the ladder, and he reached out to grab a hold, something that would stabilize him, and unbeknownst to him, what he grabbed was the rope for the town church bell, and he awakened the whole city by this controversy. And of course, when the 95 Theses were written, the immediate issue was the issue of indulgences that were being abused by their sale in a neighboring county there by Tetzel, and Luther was very much concerned about this matter. But when he wrote the 95 Theses, he included other issues beyond the issue of the indulgences, including the whole sacerdotal system of the Roman Catholic Church, specifically on the matter of the issue of the treasury of merits. And that created a firestorm in the church, and it went very quickly to the news, to Rome itself, and Luther was called on the carpet, and he asked, indeed begged, for disputations, that is, for an opportunity to debate the issue with Roman theologians, uh, lest he be misunderstood and uh, criminally indicted. Well, the first of those responses took place in 1518, in May of that year, at Heidelberg, where Luther was invited to speak to a convention of Augustinian monks, and a new general superintendent had been elected to lead that conclave. And Luther fully expected, as he was advised by his friends not even to attend, that if he went to Heidelberg, it would only be a matter of two to three weeks before he would be arrested and executed as a heretic. But nevertheless, he went and he appeared there at the conclave in Heidelberg and speaking to issues 
of the patron saint of his own monastery, St. Augustine, and Augustine's view of the depravity of man, who, apart from God's redemptive grace, could not possibly save himself. And Luther was so persuasive and so winsome at this conclave that his, the response to it was eminently pleasing to the hearers, particularly the younger uh, clergy that were assembled in that particular venue, and then including one who was visiting as a Dominican priest uh, whose name was uh, uh, a name that I know very well and can't remember. <laughs> it was Martin Butzer who was at Strasbourg, and he became a, a critical critically important element in the Reformation thereafter. And so Luther's response at Heidelberg was one that he considered a victorious moment, and he then continued to beseech the church to have serious debate and discussion about the matters. Well, the popularity with which he experienced the reception there in Heidelberg changed dramatically when he was summoned to a dispute with the leading theologian of the Roman Catholic Church, Cardinal Cajetan, who was extremely trained in debate and was erudite uh, as the supreme master of theology of 16th century Rome. And so, he came then to visit with Luther at Augsburg. And when they had that debate, it was supposedly closed to the outside world, and really what uh, <clears throat> Cajetan wanted was no part of a debate. He wanted to just simply deliver a message from the church at Rome that Luther was simply to submit to the authority of Rome and say the words, revoco, I recant. Well, Luther wasn't willing to do that without some discussion, and so he pressed some points about this issue of the treasury of merits. And in response to that, uh, and in one sense, uh, Luther was really outclassed by Cajetan, and Cajetan reminded him that this was the official teaching of the church dating back to the 14th century with Clement VI of Rome, who, pap who published a papal uh, uh, bull or, or uh, a, a, a papal uh, encyclical entitled Unigenitus uh, Unis, in which he defined clearly the doctrine of the treasury of merit. And Luther tried to quibble his way past this point of the discussion with Cajetan to no avail, and Cajetan finally got him to admit that Luther was differing from an edict that had come down from the Pope himself early in the 14th century. And so, <clears throat> losing his patience, Cajun didn't want to just get rid of Luther and have the church uh, burn him at the stake. In any case, the meeting broke up, and uh, it was seen by those who were discussing it in various faculties that Cajun was the winner because he was able to back Luther into such a position where he would say publicly that it was possible that even in a sober encyclical delivered by the Pontiff himself that the Pope could err. And even at that point in the dispute, Luther was resting his case on Scripture and on Scripture alone. And then followed another dispute at Leipzig with Germans leading, uh, the German leading theologian of that nation, whose name was Eck. The irony of that is the German meaning of the word Eck is corner, because Eck cornered Luther, where he got into a debate with Luther about earlier heresies that the church had condemned not only by the Pope, but by ecclesiastical councils. And among those uh, who had been condemned in the past were Wycliffe 
and particularly John Haas. And so Eck was able to, as I said, back Luther into a corner of his own and to describe the heresies for which uh, <clears throat> John Huss had been burned at the stake. We were in Prague several years ago and had a guided tour, and we saw the church where the Council of Constance was held and where Huss was condemned, and our guide said, this is the place where John Huss was fired took on a whole new meaning to being fired uh, as the translator uh, used that term. Instead of being burned at the stake, he said he was fired. Well, he was fired in, in a major way at that time. But the, many of the issues that for which John Huss, a century before Luther, had been condemned as a heretic included his elevation of sacred Scripture as the supreme authority of the church. And one of the great ironies of church history is that the bishop who pronounced the verdict of judgment against John Huss heard Huss say, and that word Huss in Czech means, or Hus as it is pronounced in Czech, means <clears throat> goose. And so he said to the bishop, you may cook this goose now, but there will come a time where a swan will appear and you won't be able to silence him. And at various times of celebration for Lutheran reasons in Germany, when Luther's portrait is portrayed in the background is the silhouette of a swan because the German people believed that this was the fulfillment of Hasse's prophecy of the swan who was to come. Now, here's the irony. When Martin Luther was ordained as a priest at the monastery in Erfurt, he had to lie on his stomach with his arms spread apart, prostrate before the altar, and right beneath that altar, underneath the stone, had been interred the remains of the very bishop that had condemned John Huss to death. Now, this isn't part of the history, but I think it should be. It's legend or myth that I have created just arbitrarily that I like to believe that when John Huss said to the bishop, you may cook this goose, but the swan will appear, who, whom you will not be able to silence, that the bishop said to John Huss, over my dead body. That's not history. But it wouldn't have been great <laughs> had it actually been part of the historical record. So in any case, in this maneuvering time, Eck was able to get Luther to concede that some of the very views for which John Huss had been condemned as a heretic were shared by Luther himself namely the authority of Scripture. And here, by attacking the legitimacy of the decision of the Council of Constance in the destruction of John Hus, Luther was actually saying that not only could the Pope make a mistake, as he did in the 14th century with the encyclical on the treasury of merits, but here, a church council could be wrong in making their deliberate decision of declaring John Huss a heretic. So now Luther is guilty on two counts. He's denied the infallibility of the Pope, and now the uh, infallibility of the church councils. And so by now, things are really heating up. And in 1521, the newly elected uh, <clears throat> emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, which wasn't holy or Roman or an empire, but in any case, Charles V convened the imperial diet at Worms, where Luther received the safe conduct in order to appear before the diet, and at last believed he was finally getting what he had want, wanted all along a hearing 
theological debate with Rome, the, the representatives of Rome themselves, on the issues particularly of justification by faith alone. Luther was warned by his friends not to go to Worms, saying that uh, this would be a trap set for him and safe conduct or, or else he would still be risking his life if he would appear at the imperial diet. And Luther responded to that saying, if there are as many devils as there are, in, as there are towels on the roof in Worms, and if you've ever been to a city in Germany like that and see their, their roof tiles, you know that he's talking about tens and tens of thousands of tiles. He says, if there's many devils at Worms as there are tiles on the roof, nevertheless, I must go. And so he came and appeared before the assembly. And as he appeared before the assembly, his books were placed on the table. And Luther was, again, denied an opportunity to bait the issues. The question was simply, are these your books? And he acknowledged that indeed they were his books. And again they said to him, well, then you must say before the authorities of the church and the authorities of the state, revoco, I recant. And history doesn't show this in the movies that uh, display it the way only Hollywood can. Luther trembled before this, and he tried to say, well, what parts of the books do you find offensive? Certainly there's a lot of things that in this book that don't have any controversy at all. I affirm the deity of Christ. I affirm the atonement, all these things, and they didn't want to quibble about that. They said, these are your books. Say, I revoco. Answer our question non cornutum, without horns. And then everybody assumes that, as the movies show it, that Luther stuck out his chest and his chin, and he said, you know, here I stand and all that. That's not what happened. Instead, Luther said, can I have 24 hours to think it over? After all this time and all this crisis and all this controversy, he came there and he was asking himself this question, can I alone be right about this? And so they allowed him 24 hours. He went back to his cell in the monastery, and he got on his knees and prayed one of the most poignant prayers that I've ever read in my life, where he cried out before God, and he said, God, where are you? Are you hiding? Please rise and defend me at this time. The cause is yours and I am yours." And then he resolved himself that whatever the outcome would be determined by God's sovereignty, Luther would accept. And so it was then on the next day that Luther returned to the assembly hall at Worms. And again the inter 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 interrogator said to him, now will you say, revoco. Now will you give us a plain and simple answer without any quibbling. And he said, I will answer your question, non cornutum, without horns, unless I am convinced by sacred Scripture or by evident reason, for popes and councils can and have erred in the past, so that unless I'm convinced by sacred Scripture or by evident reason, I will not recant, for my conscience is held captive by the Word of God. And to act against conscience, he said, is neither right nor safe. Let me pause for just a second. Do you hear what Luther's saying there? My conscience may be seared by my guilt, my repeated defenses against God. Maybe I have the forehead of the harlot where I've lost my capacity to blush. 
Maybe I've done everything in my power to excuse my sins before the world, as we are wont to do, but I'm sorry. I've been captured by the Word of God and held captive by the Word of God. My conscience is bound by sacred Scripture. And to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. And then, of course, the assembly hall erupted in chaos. And immediately, Charles V, uh, the emperor, repented of ever granting safety to Luther. And Luther's own friends then abducted him and whisked him off in disguise in 1521 at the Wartburg where he spent his time translating the Bible into German. That time that we have in front of us on this clock, Bob, has changed 15 times in the, in the last five minutes. So I'm trying to honor this, the time that I have. Can I have five more minutes? Okay, quickly. When the Roman Catholic Church responded in the middle of the 16th century with the Ecumenical Council of Trent, defining its position on justification and on sacred Scripture, it was the sixth session on justification that Rome declared that justification is by faith. Faith is necessary, a necessary condition to be justified, but not a sufficient condition. The issue was that little word, alone. Then earlier in the fourth session, the debate was how many sources of authority from God do we have? In the first draft of the fourth session of the Council of Trent, the Latin words were included, partim, partim. That is to say that the truth of God is revealed partly in Scripture and partly in tradition. Two delegates who were priests to the fourth session of Trent, one by the name of Bionuzio, the other by the name of Nocchiante, stood up in protest and said, we don't agree with this statement because it undermines the sufficiency and unique authority of sacred Scripture. And then, all of a sudden, the record shows that the words partim, partim disappeared from the text and we're replaced by the simple connective word, at, where Rome says that the truth of God is revealed in sacred Scripture and in tradition. Well, every Protestant believes that we believe that creeds and confessions and ecumenical councils are important and that God's truth is revealed in Scripture as well as shown to us by our historic confessions and creeds. And so the question is, did Rome respond to the protests and make that literary change in the Latin between partly this and partly that, or was it simply a stylistic question? Nobody knew at the time. Some even suspect that it was an intentional study of ambiguity to let both parties be satisfied. But that issue was finally resolved in the 20th century in Pius XII's encyclical in the 1940s called Humani Gainerus, in which it was said that there are two sources of divine special revelation, the Bible and tradition. What Luther said in the 16th century, and what we say today is as important as the instruction that we receive from the great theologians of the past, from the commentaries, from the creeds, from the confessions, as important as that is. There's only one source that has the authority absolutely to bind our consciences is sacred Scripture. That was the origin of the issue, sola scriptura. And what I want to say, thank you, what I want to say in closing to you, dear friends, is if we want to see an awakening in our time, if we want to see a new reformation in our time, what we're going to have to see are Christians whose consciences have been captured by sacred Scripture. 
and can say, here we stand. We can do no other. Let me pray with us. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word, for the prayer of our Lord himself when he prayed in the upper room. Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. And so we thank you that you have given us your unadulterated, inspired, infallible, and inerrant revelation upon which we stand and upon which the church stands or falls. For we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you thank Dr. R.C. Sproul?